All right, guys, welcome back to JBSR Plays It, um, and welcome to the long-awaited, the long-promised, well, maybe long-awaited, I don't know if you guys really wanted this, the, you know, my mid-season power rankings. Everyone's played at least eight games. It's weird when to do this. It's like, do I do it last week? Do I do it this week? Most of the teams had already played eight week, eight games last week, but then there were six teams on buy, so it didn't matter. Uh, it really it doesn't matter. Everything's subjective, so who cares? Um, I don't have any real news, obviously, because I literally hit stop on the last podcast and hit record to go right back into this one. So nothing has changed in the 13 seconds since the last podcast. So we'll get... We'll hop right into it. We'll hop right into my podcast. I'm going to discuss more teams than others because I know more teams than others. And then other, I have to defend some positions. Um, I'm one of the few people who I think will have the Seahawks ranked outside of the top 10. And actually, I'm looking at my power rankings now, and I don't even know how, high, how they got as high as they are. But that's neither here nor there. So, up first, number. I'm going to go backwards. I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up. Because I feel like it, it just works better that way. It's my one issue with ESPN Power Rankings. I can look at it, and I can see number one right off the bat. So, number 32. Sorry, Eric, it's the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And this is something I go back to. Now, obviously, I factor in the two blowout losses, and one of those blowout losses was to a terrible Atlanta Falcons team. Um... So, as much as that is a factor, and I know they've played close in a bunch of their other games... Like I said, at the end of the day, when you look at it, I take into account, I don't think Lovey Smith is going anywhere, but for Lovey Smith, for next season, assuming he, I, I'm assuming he gets another season, because he is, I mean, he's a Tampa guy, but that's why, I, you know, that's why I think he gets another season. Um, his talent going forward, he's got Gerald McCoy who they just lo uh, locked up long-term at defensive tackle. You've got Levante David at uh, linebacker, who is also a beast. And you've got the rookie wide receiver right now, Mike Evans, who is looking pretty good, just like every other rookie wide receiver in this year's class. And that's with uh, Glennon throwing him the ball right now. Um, I'm surprised they didn't trade Vincent Jackson. I don't know how much longer he'll be on that team. Uh, the offensive line... Not great. The rest of the defense, not great. Although, uh, Werner, Ultron Werner, I think it was like five Verners and Verners and Verrett's and cornerbacks in the league. I believe it's Ultron Verner is who they signed in the offseason. You know, he's a good piece to work with, too. So you've got more pieces on defense because you've only got one piece on offense, I feel. Uh, Doug Martin might be the most overrated running back in the entire game. He had one really good game his rookie season, and he's been coasting off that ever since. Um, Bobby Rainey is showing him up in that backfield. So, yeah, he, he might just be the most overrated running back in the league. Um, you know, they're 1-7 right now. This game coming up, I think the Falcons take care of him again. So, that drops him to 1-8. And, um, and their schedule doesn't really look that promising. Mostly because they're going to be that easy game on every single one. And my internet has decided not to work. Hello, what is this? That's not what I clicked on whatsoever. Uh, let's see. Schedule for the Tampa Bay Bucks. Um. Okay, so they got Atlanta coming up. Then they're at Washington, at Chicago. Uh, home for Cincinnati, at Detroit, at Carolina, home for Green Bay, and home for New Orleans in the finale. Atlanta, Washington, Chicago, those are games they could be competitive in. Baltimore, at least they're home for it. Carolina doesn't look great, but that's not exactly a gimme win either. There are some winnable games on this schedule, but things don't look great because... Every team looks at the Buccaneers as a winnable game. Um, you know, is Glennon the answer at quarterback long-term? Probably not. But very clearly, neither was McCown. So, I understand why they brought him in. You know, but at the same time, 36-year-old quarterback. 
Not everyone can walk in and be Kyle Orton. I'm sorry. It's, you're not going to get that with every single washed up quarterback who had his glory. Well, I guess Kyle Orton had a couple good years. Uh, well, Denver, he had a pretty good year before Tebow Mania took over because the rest of the team was terrible. Um, but, yeah, I mean, Josh McCown is a guy who was brought in to replace Jake the Snake Plummer and failed. And they had to bring in Tim Rattay to try and replace him. That's how it went down in Arizona. And then, obviously, Arizona hasn't had exactly great luck with rookies either. Uh, you know, they went to the Super Bowl with Kurt Warner, and now they grabbed Carson Palmer just to continue to live in the past. So, the Bucks. I'm sorry, man. I don't. I don't know what your options are going forward. You got some pieces to work with, but other than your pieces, man, it's it's just not. It's just not working. It's just not working. Everything you're doing, and I will be probably one of like three defenders of their uniforms. So you don't even have that going for you. You got you redesign your logo. That looks cool. Your jerseys aren't terrible, except for you know. I, I wish they'd change the number font, even if they just ripped it completely from the Seahawks. That would probably help. I love having the creamsicle back, but unfortunately they're playing like those creamsicle Buccaneers from the 70s. Okay, number 31. You guys going to be surprised at who is not going to be near the bottom of this list, like all the way at the bottom. Number 31 is the Jacksonville Jaguars. Um, This comes down to pieces again. It's hard to determine who is a building block on this team because essentially if you look through this entire roster everyone's only been in the league for zero or one or two years like that's the entire roster they are building from nothing so it's really tough to get a read on who's a building block for the future Blake Bortles I don't think you know he did, he's not coming in here and being Andrew Luck but he's coming in he's throwing picks because he's got to try and make everything happen they're one and eight they're losing all the time. He's got to try and make something happen. The defense is starting to play better. Gus Bradley is showing that, yes, hey, look, I was a defensive coordinator. But I don't know that Gus Bradley – I mean, Khan might let him stay around, but I, I, this is year two for him. I thought he was a first-year coach, but no, he, he is not. This is year two for Bradley, and I don't know that he makes it to year three. Uh, you know, Bortles, again, having his struggles, throwing some picks, making some good throws – Put up some good numbers at least. But, you know, his top three wide receivers are all rookies. And you've got Justin Blackman on suspension for the year. It doesn't sound like they're bringing him back. It sounds like once he's reinstated, they're going to try and trade or release him. So, which is unfortunate because he might be a pretty good wide receiver for him. But I get why they're fed up with his crap. Um... The, the offensive line is looking terrible. Jokel is not looking like somebody worthy. Was he the number two? He was the number two overall pick, and Fisher was number one, right? They're both not doing great. But neither is the rest of the offensive line for this team. So it's coming down to their defense playing pretty well, though that's more so a schematic thing. I don't, I don't like throwing schematic around because it makes it, it – it, it's not that they play in a complex scheme. It's just that Gus Bradley presents a really good defense, and the players are good. He's doing very well at teaching them how to execute it. Same thing with Rex Ryan in New York. You know, he's a very good defensive coordinator. He can make his players look better than maybe they are. So the Jaguars have that going for them, but if Gus Bradley's gone next year, then that doesn't mean anything, and then you're just down to it, – it's just – I mean, the general manager, I heard him on um, uh, Move the Sticks podcast, and he was basically talking about how this is a long-term rebuilding process where it's just, they're just screwed. So, not not good if you're a Jaguars fan. It, are there Jaguars fans? If there are Jaguars fans out there, please write to me at shane at jellybeansniper.net. Let me know, because I, as far as I know... There have not been Jaguars fans since Fred Taylor left town. Moving on, number 30, and here's a team that everyone thought would maybe be 32. 
The Oakland Raiders at 0-8. Yes, the more this goes on, the more you realize we haven't talked about the Jets yet. The Oakland Raiders have some pieces, so that's more so why, even though they're 0-8, they've looked way more competitive in their losses than even someone like the Bucks have. Um, have I don't know that they've gotten... They had to have gotten blown out at least once, right? Come on, schedule. Don't let me down. Uh, let's see. 19-14. 30-14 against Houston. 16-9. Yeah, 38-14 against Miami. Uh, 31-28. 24-13. 23-13. 30-24. So not blown out as much as maybe they should be considering who they are. And you're looking at... You know, seven point loss to New England, six point loss to Seattle. You know, eleven point losses Arizona. But if you look at it right now, that first game of the season against the Jets, if they win that one instead of the Jets, then the Jets are the ones sitting at zero and nine, and the Raiders are sort of off the Schneid. Um, so that you, we might have had our first overall pick bowl in the first week of the season, and the problem with the Raiders right now. And why I keep saying they could go 0-16 and why a lot of people are saying that's a possibility. This is a very good 0-8 team. And I know that's that sounds a little uh, contradictory. But they're 0-8. They look much better than a lot of teams who have finished 4-12. and But they have a home game for the Broncos this week. Then they're at San Diego, home for Kansas City, at St. Louis, home for the 49ers, at Kansas City, Home for Buffalo at Denver. They don't even get two straight home or away games. Like, there's alternate week after week. Luckily, everything except, you know, every single game they play is technically a West Coast game. Though, again, uh, St. Louis and Kansas City, very obviously, those are not in the West Coast. I don't know who decided to align the divisions that way, but that's just how it works. Um,. Hey, I can get a ticket for the San Diego game for 13 bucks, or I could go to St. Louis and get one for 8 No one wants to go to that game. St. Louis is the most likely place where they could get a victory, but St. Louis, they're both in the same boat. They both kind of look better than maybe their record implies. They've both got serious issues and deficiencies, though. Um, but Derek Carr looks really good, and if it wasn't for the great wide receivers, he would, if you're going to give it to a quarterback, you're giving it to Derek Carr. Um... Which is great. I'm rooting for this guy. I feel bad for what happened to David Carr in Houston. It can't be easy becoming the quarterback for an expansive, expansive, uh, expansion franchise. And if you ever question that, do yourself a favor and look at Kerry Collins' career trajectory. Because that's pretty much what happened to him. Whereas the Jaguars lucked out and got Mark Brunell off of the basically third-string quarterback behind Brett Favre in Green Bay. That was a weird stretch in Green Bay. Anyone else remember that? At one point, I think you had like five starters in the league who were backups to Brett Favre. Because you had Matt Hasselbeck. You had Kurt Warner. Yeah, he was one too. You had Mark Brunell. Aaron Brooks, if anyone remembers him. And maybe it was just four. They were all backups to Brett Favre at one point, And they were all starting. Uh, Aaron Brooks between New Orleans and Oakland. Mark Brunell... Long time on the Jaguars, then eventually went to the Redskins. Matt Hasselbeck, uh, Seahawks, obviously now he's the backup for the Colts. Um, you know, and Kurt Warner, we all know where he went. So, <coughs> sorry. Yeah, Derek Carr is just, you know, he went to the second round because of his brother. No one made any bones about that. He... The same reason why Eli was the number one overall pick because of Peyton. Derek Carr was a second round pick because of David. And what's hilarious is that both of them could have very similar career paths. Because uh, Derek Carr is putting up some pretty Eli numbers, which actually isn't bad for someone who... James Jones is his top wide receiver. Who was the guy who got let go from Green Bay because he dropped more passes than he caught. And other than that, he's really got nobody. It's just, it's an interesting scenario for Derek Carr. Um, you know, Khalil Mack's pretty good. But a lot of that, other than that, it's like, it's a pretty barren roster. It's a lot of, you know, like Donald Penn got brought in to be left tackle because they got him for a one-year deal. Um, 
you know, with no guaranteed money. It's it's sort of if I I am actually rooting for John Gruden to come back to Oakland and take over this team because I think he's got some pieces to work with. Um, I think he still has the intelligence to do it. I know a lot of these guys who go into broadcasting and come back. You look in hockey, you look at Barry Melrose, who is like the only hockey guy on staff at ESPN anymore, I believe. Barnaby's still there? I haven't watched it. I haven't watched ESPN in a couple of years. Um, but Barry Melrose left to coach the Tampa Bay Lightning and got fired within three months. So... A lot of these guys doesn't always work out. But then you look at baseball. Buck Showalter went from ESPN, went to the Orioles, and has turned around that franchise and turned them into a contender. So it can go either way. You never, you can't just dismiss it. Uh, I think John Gruden, I think he could do pretty well with this team. So I would love to see that. Number 29. It's pretty obvious who's going to be this low on the list. It's the Tennessee Titans. We're, we're getting there, Jets fans. Don't worry. We're getting there. Um, I'm rating this on what the team has done so far this season, not the train wreck they're going to do. So don't worry, the Jets will be down here. They will be much lower if I do this in three weeks. I'm sure of it. Uh, Tennessee Titans, who I just forgot where the hell they play. Um, they're on their third starting quarterback of the season. Zach Mettenberger made headlines because he had a mustache and took a selfie. And then J.J. Watt beat the living hell out of him. Statistically, he didn't put up a bad game, but it doesn't mean anything. Um, I don't think he should be starting because I don't think there are six-round picks who should be starting their rookie season. Even like Tom Brady, he didn't play his rookie season. It was his uh, second year in the league. And again, he was sort of an anomaly that you don't go by him. But even Tom Brady didn't start his rookie season. Just remember, so six-round picks... I don't think – was Brady a fifth or a sixth? Now I don't remember. Get that jammed in your head all the time, and now I can't remember. Um, Bishop Sankey, they're going with him at running back because they have no other option. When you look at this team in Madden, it's sort of funny because they have the worst running backs in the league and the word like, they don't even have a quarterback who hits 70 overall. That's how terrible they are with that. The running game isn't looking much better. Their offensive line is just falling apart. I was pissed off when and, and, uh, Andy Levitre got signed away from Buffalo to go to Tennessee, and now they're just falling apart. And I'm just not that the Bills' offensive line looks much better at times, but it's just funny to see. Um, Taylor Lewan stepping in to start. I don't know what's going on, with Mike Lower. I will always root for that guy because I'm a sucker for throw. You know the story, but. Besides, you know, they win 26-10 over Kansas City in the opening game, then lose 26-10 against Dallas, and it's just all gone downhill from there. Even Jacksonville, they only won by two points. So, but 26-10, 33-7, they lost to Cincinnati. Um, 41-17 against the Colts. One-point loss to the Browns. Uh, you know, two-point win against the Jaguars. Two-point loss to Washington. 14-point loss to Houston. It's it's not looking great. Ooh, for $11, I can watch them play the Jets. Won't that be exciting? It, Ken Wisenhunt is the reason why I don't rank them a little lower, I think. Even though they have two wins, I'm not going by wins and losses necessarily. Obviously, that's a pretty good reflection of your team, but there's other things that factor into it. But Ken Wisenhunt's a pretty good coach. Their wide receivers would be way more recognized if they had someone to throw them the ball. Same with their tight end. Uh, their defense, they've got some pieces. So I think this is a team that is a starving for a quarterback. And maybe this is where Colt McCoy goes. If they don't end up getting a, you know, a top-tier uh, quarterback this year, you know, if they don't get Mariota or uh, Jameis Winston, and I, you can argue whether you want Jameis Winston at this point, but if they don't get one of the top-tier guys who can step in and start right away, maybe you bring in Colt McCoy. I think all three of the quarterbacks... Well, maybe not all three. I think Whitehurst and Locker are gone after this season. I think it's pretty obvious. They they want nothing to do with Locker anymore. And Whitehurst is just getting paid a buttload of money to sit on the bench and have great hair. So, I, you know, Mettenberg, I don't think he cut him, but... You know... You, you never know. 
Okay. Good catch, Grimes. Um, there's a lot not to like about the Tennessee team, even though they've got some pieces, but there's a lot to like. It's just, it's tough to figure out. <laughs> I had them ranked a little higher, and then with more time to think about it, even though they were on a bye, just, it just, I didn't have any reason to like them. Now, I am going to be picking them this week, but that's only because they're playing the Ravens, and you know my rule. Uh, there's not really a lot to talk about with this team, so I'm going to move off them because they've gotten more airtime than I would have liked. Next up, here we go, finally. Here you guys go. Number 28, the New York Jets. Expect this to plummet, but they almost had New England. Um, they, um, they almost had New England. They barely beat Oakland, though. Like, that, like I said, that could come back as a big game in both of their seasons for all the wrong reasons. You know, gave that game to Green Bay. Eight-point loss to Chicago. Seven-point loss to Detroit. Then they got shut out by the Chargers, and it's just it has not been going well. You know, 14-point loss to the Broncos. Played it close against the Patriots. And then just got blown out with six turnovers against the Bills. Uh, 14 point loss to Kansas City, and now they got the Pittsburgh Steelers after Roethlisberger has put up 12 touchdown passes, and they have no secondary to speak of. And then they get the Bills again. Or no, they get then they get a bye, then they get the Bills again. So it's just it hasn't looked good for the Jets. There's some games they could have won, but at the end of the day, the could haves would only really translate to three wins instead of one. Yeah, you know, you're talking three and five instead of one and eight, which isn't exactly a very good consolation prize. Or three and six, I'm sorry. They've played nine games, they haven't had their bye. So the only reason why they're not lower on this list is because I think everyone else below them has looked even worse. Um and actually I almost had them at twenty seven, but with this team, there's not a lot of pieces there. Do they sign Percy? Do they keep Percy Harvin? They basically rent him year to year now because of his contract. He's got no guaranteed monies. Excuse me. So at any point, you just let him go. Uh, so it's up to them whether or not they want to keep him around. But I... <coughs> Sorry. Yeah. If I'm, je- if I'm looking at head coaching positions, the Jets are not one that I want anything to do with. If it, if it's me, they have no quarterback. They have no running back. Their wide receivers are on rental projects or rental projects. Rookie tight end, sure. Offensive line, get it? You know, it's a good offensive line, but it's the same one they've had in place since two thousand and seven. You know, Nick Maingold and Debrickashaw Ferguson all of a sudden are on the wrong side of thirty. So all of a sudden you have to look at depth, and you know, Vladimir Dukas obviously. Sorry, UMass alum, but you failed. Um, there's, you know, there's some pieces on defense, but again, when Rex leaves, what does this defense do? Because, again, playing under his game plans, his schemes, his playbook, they're going to look way better than under just someone who's an average, even slightly above average defensive coordinator. So, sorry, Jets fans. Next up, we've got, at number 27, the Atlanta Falcons, the team. I almost put them below the Jets, and then I remembered that Matt Ryan looks pretty incredible this season. It's unfortunate that no one else does. This is a team, Mike Smith is, I think he's out. I don't see Arthur Blank as necessarily a patient owner. I don't care that Mike Smith is arguably the best coach. I don't even know if it's arguable. Best coach in Atlanta Hawks. Atlanta Hawks, Atlanta Falcons history. They just have not looked good with Matt Ryan, with Julia or Julio Jones, with Roddy White. You know, obviously they need a tight end, and that is not an overrated. You know, that is something you need in today's day and age. You look at Gronkowski, and how the Patriots are, look like a completely different team with him playing. Um, but that is something that you desperately need and they don't have that 
they don't have a running game. They're still relying on Steven Jackson, who I love Steven Jackson, but his prime was four years ago. And they just do not have the personnel to move away. Um, and their schedule coming up, it, it, the, the South is just unfortunate. Not only is it filled with terrible teams, but they've also got just terribly hard schedules. You know, at Tampa Bay this week and then at Carolina, so potentially those could be competitive games. Then home for Cleveland, home for Arizona, at Green Bay, home for Pittsburgh, at New Orleans, home for Carolina. It's not looking great. Not that I necessarily think that they couldn't catch the Packers or Browns off guard. But I don't think they will. Um, it's weird this team was 2-1 and one at one point, and it is, they just haven't looked good since. Um, you know, and really, some of the games have been close, but they only play one side of the ball. Their offensive line is terrible. And their defense is non-existent, but they got some good skill players. They can, you know, they got a pretty good aerial attack they could launch. But it's just not coming together for them. And I think maybe it is time. Mike Smith has been there for, what, six years now? Him and Rex came in at the same time. So he's been there for six years. You're not always going to – I know back in the old days you keep the same coach for a while, but it's, it doesn't work the same way anymore because you could also keep the same players. You don't have that luxury anymore. So with – the salary cap with free agency you're not going to keep your entire core roster together for 10 years this is not going to happen belichick has done it with maybe way too much turnover but at the same time he has also been there for 15 16 years um and you know his first season he went 5 and 11 and that's the last time he was under 500 his worst season other than that was 2002 they were 9 and 7 other than belichick you know tomlin will be around for a while because of the loyalty issue but Sometimes six years, if it's not working anymore, it might just be time to move on. Um, you know, Andy Reid had a pretty good run in Philly. Uh, Jeff Fisher had a pretty good run a while back with Tennessee. It, it's been six years for Mike Smith. You know, second, third overall pick last season. Looking at that same thing again this year, it does. It might be time for someone new to come in, and I don't think that's the end of Mike Smith as a head coach. I just think that's the end of Mike Smith as a head coach in Atlanta. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying that he should be run out of the league. You know, maybe take a season, sit back on the bench, wait for a good opportunity to open up because there are going to be some head coach openings. There always are, but Oakland. I don't know if you want that challenge. Um, you know, who else might be open? I mean. I don't know if the Bucks will. The Jaguars might. Do you really want the Jaguars job? Titans job might be open. I don't know. Uh, Jets, I don't want it. You know. Redskins. No one, Dan Snyder will fire a head coach after a season. This is what he does. Redskins could be open. I don't think the Bears will be open. The Panthers might. Uh, there, there will be some more head coaching openings. You know, Rams are a possibility. Giants, who knows if Tom Coughlin wants to hang it up. So, there will be some possibilities out there. I just don't know if you want... Besides maybe the Giants, I don't know if you want any of those jobs. Uh, next up, we've got number 26. Those Redskins that I was just referring to. They're sitting at 3-6 and six on the year. They have decided that they're just... You know, every quarterback got a shot. Kirk Cousins is not an answer. He's not even a first-round pick anymore. Not a second round, not a third, not a fourth. Maybe a fifth or a sixth. Maybe. Um, our, uh, uh, this is my notes right here. RG3 went from trade bait back to franchise quarterback just because no one else could step it up with their opportunity. Um, I think the Redskins keep Kirk Cousins on the roster. I don't think he's getting cut. I think as a backup, he's not... A terrible option. He put up some pretty good yards. He just turned the ball over. He never won. But I don't think the rest of the team around him is very talented. I think they just locked into 10-6 and six because of how good RG3 was that year. But I I think you keep him on the roster because I think Colt McCoy, if he's a free agent after this year, I think he goes somewhere else. I don't blame him. There's a starting opportunity in probably three other teams right now that he could get. <coughs> Sorry. So, it's just, it's not a good year. Brian Arakbo is probably done. 
And my other note on here, I put that Kirk Cousins just went from Matt Schaub to Matt Flynn, which is true. I mean, Matt Schaub, he was a backup for Michael Vick, you know, another guy who got injured all the time. They ended up getting a second-round pick out of uh, the Houston Texans for him. That worked pretty well for Houston for a while. Not very good for Atlanta because they pulled that trade, and that's when the uh, dogfighting deal all came out. So that was definitely a Houston win in that one. I know right now it seems inconceivable that you would give a second-round pick for Matt Schaub, but at the time it, it was, you know, 4,000, 4,500-yard passer, 30, 35, 40 touchdowns. Pretty good production out of that guy back in the day. He just fell apart last season. And he could not get it back going in Oakland. So, um, they, they, you know, they're putting up some yards, but they're not finishing. They're not doing well, really, in any way imaginable. Um, schedule coming up. Let's see, they've got Tampa Bay. They've got at San Francisco, at Indy, home for St. Louis, at the Giants, home for Philly, home for Dallas to wrap it up. So three straight division games to wrap it up. Um, it's not inconceivable that they can win three of those games. It's not, you know, six and ten isn't out of the question. But that might be your best case scenario because you got to figure Tampa Bay, after, like, they got to buy this week, then home for Tampa Bay. Um home for St. Louis at the at the inconsistent Giants. The Giants blew them out 45-14 last time, but it's it's not inconceivable to think that maybe they can win 3. You know, maybe they can catch San Fran cuz San Fran's all over the freaking place. Um but it's not a good season for them in any way you want to slice it up. So moving on to number 25, we have the team that a lot of people thought would be contenders, the Chicago Bears, sitting at 3-5 and five and looking pretty bad doing it. Maybe I should have swapped them up with the uh, team I have ahead of them. They're both pretty similar, though. Um, the problem with them, Jay Cutler, obviously everyone thing gets thrown on him, but that's just, Jay Cutler has been doing this his entire career. He's not going to stop now. He's never going to stop. And it's fr like watching the locker room explode is sort of why they drop maybe this far down. Because maybe the three and five teams, this is the one you got to believe maybe has the best chance to turn it around, and get into the playoffs. Because in that conference, you got them at three and five, Panthers three five and one, Rams at three and five, Giants at three and five. You figure them and the Giants are the ones you're more likely to think, well, maybe they can turn it around and get hot. But their locker room has blown up, and now I don't feel that way. I feel like this is the makings of maybe a 5-11 and 11 team. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe they're 7-9, and 8-8, eight and eight, but I don't think they're contending. Their schedule coming up, they're at Green Bay. Uh, you know, they're on a bye. Or no, week 10. So they're coming off the bye at Green Bay. Uh, Jay Cutler has never won there in his career. So at Green Bay... Home for Minnesota, home for Tampa Bay, at Detroit, home for Dallas, home for New Orleans, home for Detroit, at Minnesota. I mean, theoretically, they should be able to beat Tampa, split Minnesota, and maybe eke out another win. Maybe catch New Orleans at uh, New Orleans being on the road. You know, maybe get the six and ten. Um, but I don't see much better than that for them. And that's if. And also, we haven't seen Jay Cutler go down and miss extended time either. And I don't know who their backup quarterback is. It's uh, I want to say it's Jimmy Clausen. I want to say that's the guy who would be coming in and filling in. So, not a reliable run. So maybe maybe Cutler plays a full sixteen games for once and surprises us all. But I don't I don't feel like that's it. Uh, but even when Jay Cutler is putting up yards and putting up points, um, which actually isn't really that often but <coughs> sorry their defense just is not stopping anyone I mean 51-23 they lost to the the uh, Patriots very good Patriots team but that's still allowing 51 points that's not a good thing you know 23-20 they lose to the Bills you know 
in wins, they allow 20 points to the 49ers, 19. Um, you know, it. they're not as bad. I remember the Saints a while back. They literally, their defense gave up. Their average, I think it was something like, it wasn't even that, like the average was like 25 points a game that they gave up, but that wasn't the interesting part. The interesting part was they gave up at least 21 points every single game. So all you had to do was hold their offense to 18 and you were going to win every time you faced the Saints. I don't remember. I believe this was maybe it was the first year with Breeze or the first year after Breeze. I don't remember. Um, Maybe the first year before. I, I, I don't know if Breeze was there. But they're not quite at that level. Uh, you know, they only allowed 13 to Atlanta. Uh, 19 to New York. But other than that, they've allowed 20 in every single game. So it's... Their defense is just not stopping the other team from scoring. Um, not that, that, that Cutler's really putting up a lot of points... But, you know, 28 points they've scored against San Francisco and they still barely win that game. They just, you know, 24 points against Carolina, but they allowed 31. This is the Buccaneers, or not the Buc. I'm sorry. The, uh, the Steelers right now are sort of doing what um, the objective was for Chicago to do, which is convert from a defense-heavy team into an offense and pass-friendly team. And Chicago arguably has better wide receivers than Brandon Marshall and uh, Alshon Jeffrey, although I still think Antonio Brown is the best wide receiver in the league right now. But there's way more depth going around in Pittsburgh. And on top of it, there's more going for them. They brought, you know, Pittsburgh brought, brings back Brett Kiesel, James Harrison, and they have career renaissance. Maybe... The Bears should sign Brian Urlacher. I don't think he's doing much, right? Maybe bring him back. Maybe I'm going too far. I don't, I just, I don't see very much going for this team. But there's still, I mean, there's obviously some pieces there. You know, Kyle Long is um, doing pretty good at right guard. Um, You know, uh, Kyle, Kyle Fuller? I know it's Fuller is their cornerback. So remember if it's Kyle Fuller or not. You know, he had that pretty good opening game or second game, whatever, when he had three picks. I think it was the second game. Or no, that was the New York game. That's what it was. That was the New York game. So there are some pieces in place. But it's just I don't think Trustman's getting canned after this season, although maybe if they go five and eleven, maybe they consider it. But it, I do kind of find it funny that they fired Lovey because they were going ten and six and not winning the Super Bowl, so they canned him. And this will be year number two without Lovey Smith and no playoffs. Maybe not your best call. Uh, next up, and I'm already I'm looking at the time right now. I'm already at thirty nine minutes. I know I took a little bit of a break in there. When I you guys won't see it, but when I edit it, um, I'm only getting to number twenty four, and we're already past the half hour mark. So this is going to be a two parter for sure. Which is unfortunate because my voice is going to be tired. So, four podcasts. I'm going to put both of these up, I think, the same day. I think I'll put one up, like, earlier in the afternoon and another one later on. Uh, but number 24, you've got the 3-5-1 and one Carolina Panthers. They were a little higher than this because, number one, they were in first place. And number two, Cam Newton looked really good. Like, he started off looking really good. And now he's back to looking like crybaby Cam. My least favorite player in the league besides Jay Cutler. Um, Kelvin Benjamin is a stud. He, although you wonder what maybe he could have done with Steve Smith there. Maybe he doesn't do much of anything. Maybe they don't even draft him if Steve Smith is there. Who even knows? It's tough to figure out. Um, their defense has looked pretty bad. If we're being honest, the defense hasn't looked great considering what they should be doing. Uh, I don't have the DVOA numbers or anything here, but this is just... It has to be a disappointing... Like, everyone knew they were going to regress, but I think 
people thought they'd have a pretty good defense and their offense sort of keep them, you know, do enough to maybe keep some games close. And they're not getting blown out. 38-17 against Green Bay, 28-10 against New Orleans. Um, 37-19, 30, okay, maybe they are getting blown out. Never mind, I take that back. I just looked at out of their five losses, I can point to four two-score losses. They almost, 13-9 against Seattle, they almost had them. Um, it's, and, I mean, coming up, they're at Philly, and they've got, you know, they played Thursday against New Orleans, and it's a Monday night game, so they've got an, some extended, um, extended time to prepare for that game. Uh, home for Atlanta, a bye at Minnesota, at New Orleans, home for Tampa, home for Cleveland, at Atlanta. They can win two, three more of those games, but I think that might be it. And, you know, who knows? Six, nine, and one still might be enough to win this division. Maybe. Although New Orleans, not only have they won, they've looked pretty good doing it. Um, so, this... It's a team I want to root for and I can't. Because they're not doing anything particularly well. And that's unfortunate. Because I thought at least their defense would be good. Like, everyone thought their defense would be good. Cakley is amassing tackles, but he's not really doing anything else to help that team. And I, But I think the 97 tackles would be looked at and pointed at and said, oh, look, he's still amazing. It's like, well, no, it's because everyone else around him sucks and he gets all these tackles that he can just accumulate. Um, thank you. I'm assuming you guys said bless you. I hate these wide receiver screens. You can't just hold down the button as soon as you snap it sometimes. Um, but yeah, their defense is underachieving. And I wrote here, the tie might be the season highlight. It very well could be. Then again, the Bengals might not be nearly as good as they looked in the beginning of the season. So maybe maybe they're not. Um, but moving on. And this is, okay, these two, I might bump this team up a couple spots if Peterson comes back. But number 23 is the Vikings, even though they're at 4-5. and five. And the other 4-5 and five team I have at number 19. But this is assuming that you're looking at no Adrian Peterson for the year, which is still in play. You're looking at... Oh, good, he did get in for the touchdown. I love when those screen plays work. Um, you know... Teddy Bridgewater, if I'm saying the best rookie quarterback has been Derek Carr, Teddy Bridgewater is in second place. Maybe not that close, but he's in second place. Um, although I will say this, looks way better than Bortles. Manziel still hasn't played, and uh, I'm not I'm not putting Mettenberg anywhere on that list. I'm going to put him at, like, number seven. I'll find someone to invent. Did Sammy Watkins throw a pass in a game? It's... You know, the O-line is looking terrible, though. Um, is it Matt Is it Matt Khalil? Matt Khalil and Ryan Khalil is the center in Carolina, right? Matt Khalil has looked terrible. He's looked just awful. And the rest of the offensive line hasn't fared much better. You know, you've got a two-headed monster for some reason with McKinnon and Matt Asiata. Asiata literally just ruining people's fantasy lives and me just sitting there wondering why you're starting McKinnon to begin with. Um... You know, their wide receivers, they, you know, Quarter L. Patterson, they haven't figured out how to use them. It's the same thing like Tavon Austin. You've got this weapon, but you need the offense to put him in. Where do you put him? You know, everyone talked about Devin Hester became a, a weapon in Atlanta. I haven't heard anything about him since those first three games. But the Vikings, I mean, they're four and five. They're very much so still in the conversation for the playoffs. I don't know how realistically they're in this conversation. But you can't exactly discount them. Uh, they they beat St. Louis. They beat Atlanta. They beat Tampa and Washington. They've beaten all the cream puffs. So maybe not that well and alive. But they're at Chicago, home for Green Bay, home for Carolina, home for New York, the uh, Jets, at Detroit, at Miami, home for Chicago. Like I said, if they split these Chicago games, if they can take care of Carolina at home... I mean, it'll be snowing because they're playing outdoors this year. 
But if they can if they can take care of Carolina at home, the Jets at home, and finish off the season with a win against the Bucks, make that their split. You know, seven and nine. That's respectable. That is respectable considering Matt Castle went down, so you had to get Bridgewater out there sooner than you were expecting. And you lost Adrian Peterson for a good chunk, if not the entire season. And I'm making all these predictions based off the fact that Adrian Peterson will not play again this year. If he comes back in, maybe you win both games against Chicago. If he comes back after the bye, you know, maybe you can take care of at Detroit and upset him. Um, Maybe you can... No, at Miami, it's at Miami. Never mind. So, you know, I'm not going to sit here and say that for sure, the Vikings are going 5-11. and 11. You know, I think they can be around that 8-8 eight eight mark. Um, Maybe they can sneak in. You know, maybe they can surprise, win a couple really good games and get up to 9-7. and seven. It's possible. They've got some pieces there. It's just they're where they are bad. They are bad. Um, but yeah, like I said, I might move them up a couple spots if Peterson does manage to come back after this bye. Uh, so number 22, I've got the St. Louis Rams at three and five. They're playing competitive. They have wins over San Francisco and Seattle. That puts them at two and one in their division. You can argue how good those teams are, but the simple fact of the matter is they beat them both. They haven't played Arizona yet. I don't believe. Maybe they have. Um, Austin Davis, I think he's cooling down. Like I said in my uh, in my week nine uh, recap, I think he's cooling down. But I don't think... I don't know. Uh, he still might be an option. Maybe he can sort of pick it back up later on. Um, they're sitting at three and five. I don't think they're going to contend for the playoffs. Mostly because they're number four in their division. Maybe they can catch the 49ers, but I don't think they can make up enough ground to get to that six seed. Not with the five and three Packers team and a six and three Cowboys team still in contention. So, but I think they can really ruin a couple seasons. Yeah, no, they haven't played Arizona. So this week coming up, they're at Arizona, home for Denver, at San Diego, home for Oakland, at Washington, home for Arizona, home for New York, for the Giants, and at Seattle. They're, I wouldn't rule it out with them splitting those Arizona games, honestly, just because of the way they've played against teams that arguably could have better talent. Uh, you know, they got some tough games because they play the West. But, you know, even if they don't, even if they lose their next three and drop down to three and eight, Oakland at Washington, home for Arizona, home for New York, realistically, they could go three and one in that stretch. You know, I have a respectable. Six and ten, maybe even seven and nine season this year. It's not out of the question. I do like that tickets for that Seattle game at the end of the season are $141. But then their home game for Arizona is only seven. I would much rather spend money and see Arizona. You know, this is a team, like I said, they don't have an answer at quarterback. They don't have an answer at running back. They don't have an answer at wide receiver. They don't really have a ton of answers at run at offensive line but their tight end might be good enough to get them through and that's always a good option or not they um they've got a great coach which always helps i think he'll be back even with a six and ten team i think he'll be back uh if this defense can play as well as they should that's where i think they can get up to seven or eight wins if they play as well as they should. If they can have some more eight sack performances. And also if Austin Davis can limit his mistakes and maybe be a little more efficient. Cause he doesn't have a running game to fall back on. Like that's his that's his biggest downside. It's not like you have Marshall Falk back there anymore. You don't have Steven Jackson in his prime back there anymore. You Trey Mason is now the starter. Trey Mason the I think he was like the third string running back coming into the season, because I think they were talking about Cunningham maybe replacing Zach Stacy. You're talking about your potentially your third string running back is starting for you. 
you know, your number one wide receiver who was not very good, or, well, not having a very good statistical season at least, to begin with, he's out. There's just... It's not... There's some pieces there. There's some, you know, and some very important pieces. You know, you've got a pretty solid defensive line. Aaron Donald, I don't know that he'd be my defensive rookie of the year right now. But he's definitely at least number two then. Um, you know, there is there is some stuff to like. There's some big problems. And maybe just addressing, you know, maybe if you get some really good wide receivers, Austin Davis can do some damage. Or maybe if you get a good quarterback, the wide receivers play a little better. Or maybe if you get an efficient running game, both sides. There's Because all three aspects of their game are leaving a ton to be desired, you can never properly evaluate it because you just don't know what is the root cause. And honestly, sometimes it's easier to replace all of it. Um, moving up, number 21, you've got the New York Giants, who started off terrible, got hot, then went back to being terrible. Eli's looked pretty good. He's not going to hit that 70%. Um, I don't think they're a playoff team. But again, with that East, with the way that the teams playing ahead of them are looking, it, you can never rule it out. Um, you know, they did. I mean, they had that really good stretch, and they looked really good. And it's hard to put a finger on what exactly is terrible about this team. It's just everyone... They're developing at a couple of spots. I honestly think... I don't think Tom Coughlin should be fired from this Giants team because he has two rings in an era dominated by the other Manning brother and Brady and Roethlisberger has two rings. I don't think he should be fired, but I think it might be getting time for him to step away. Maybe a little forced. I mean, he's in his 70s, right? Like, he's been coaching forever. He was the first coach of the Jaguars, I believe, and then he went to the Giants. So he's been coaching. He has not had a year off since 95. He's been coaching this entire time. The Jaguars actually have had, up until these last few years, very few coaches in their history. Because I think they went, I think they're only on coach number four, right? Because they went, they had, um, they had Tom Coughlin, then they went to Jack Del Rio. Then it was Mike Malarkey for a year, and then now we're at Gus Bradley. I believe that is the entirety of the coaching hist of the twenty years of coaching in Jacksonville history. So, but yeah, ninety five. He's he's there, and I don't know what he was doing beforehand, but he's been coaching for almost twenty years. I think it might be time. Yeah, head coaching for almost twenty years might be time to take a step back. I mean, so has Jeff Fisher, but I think Jeff Fisher got into it a little bit younger than Coughlin did. It's sort of like, I love Bruce Arians. Bruce Arians, spoiler alert, he's my coach of the year right now. I think he's everybody's coach of the year. But he's also significantly older, so you're not going to see him go on a 20-year stretch. I think you're going to see him for maybe seven or eight years. Um, you know, if he lasts seven years at the Cardinals, which he should at this point, and then sort of, you know, he retires or he gets fired or whatever, I think that might be the end of Bruce Arians. Um, I think Coughlin just needs to step away. Um, I, I just don't think it's... There's pieces there, and I'm sure he could turn this team into an 8-8 eight eight team, and I'm sure he could t have a 10-6 and six squad next year. But I think it just might be time for it to sort of wear off. Um, they had a good run, and I think Coughlin should go to the Hall of Fame. I don't think there's a question in my mind that that should happen, but I, just, I think it's time for him to step away. Um... Maybe some fresh blood can get this team to an 11-win team next year. You never know. Uh, number 20, I have the 49ers. Like I've been saying, the Jim Harbaugh thing, I believe, is overshadowing what the rest of the team is doing, and they're not doing very well. And every loss makes Jim Harbaugh getting fired seem more and more plausible. And every win is like, oh, well, was that going to be enough? So he can't win no matter what. Um... They do have some, you know, they got players returning. They got Alden Smith coming back. They've, um, you know, I, they've, so they've got some pieces coming back. But also their offensive line isn't looking that great. And that's supposed to be their bread and butter. Frank Gore is still looking pretty respectable. 
But it's obvious he's getting close to the end of his career. But every time you tell that guy that, he just decides to rush for 150 yards and break 75 tackles in the game. So I'm not going to tell him that. Um, it's... It, this is not a Super Bowl team for the 49ers. It's not at all. But... This... I think Harbaugh's gone after the year at this rate. I think he takes a head coaching job wherever the hell it may be. Maybe he goes back to Michigan in college. Maybe he picks up another one of these head coaching vacancies. He can take whatever job he wants. So maybe he does go for that Oakland spot if he doesn't want to stay in the Bay Area. You never know. But that's up to him. And, you know, and Kaepernick is just being Kaepernick. He's looked the same his entire career. We're not being surprised. He's not playing worse than we thought he would be. He's not playing better than we thought he would be. He's just playing the exact same kind of football he's played this entire time. And I don't know who wins. Hey, look, I didn't get sacked by J.J. Watt. I Oh, yes. How are you going to give him a sack? I ran. Bastards. J.J. Watt got me. And I'm going to use that as a lead-in. I am done uh, talking about the 49ers. But number 20, I've got the Houston Texans. And literally in my notes, I've got like a quick like sentence or two couple you know like three or four notes for each team written down next to the number 19 houston texans i just wrote down jj watt that's not giving this team as much credit as they deserve this entire defense has looked pretty good and that's missing um uh jadavian that's missing Clowney. jadavian Clowney. uh you know he hasn't been on the field he's been hurt uh jj watt obviously is Defensive player of the year. Give it to him now. There's no competition. I don't even consider other players for that award. It's like, oh, you mean J.J. Watt's award. So, I, you know, Arian Foster is looking pretty good again. Um, other than that, I mean, yeah, the defense is look. you know, it's the defense, Arian Foster, and then just Ryan Fitzpatrick killing this team. It might be Ryan Mallett time. You know, you traded for him. See what you got. Maybe you got something good. Maybe you don't. You're four and five. You know, you're in 12th place in the AFC. Granted, you're not out of it, but you're in 12th place. So maybe it's time to start looking at your other options. Um, I believe they still have Jaguars and Titans. I think they have three games against those teams still coming up. Yeah. They've, they're... On a bye, and they're at Cleveland, home for Cincy, home for Tennessee, at Jacksonville, at Indy, home for Baltimore, home for Jacksonville. So maybe don't give up on the season just yet. You got at Cleveland and home for Baltimore. Those are two games. If you can win those games, you control your own destiny for a wild card spot, you would think. Or at least put yourself in very good tiebreaker position. Um, and then you got three games, hopefully, to boost up. You know what? I take it back. Three, four, nine and seven. Nine and seven might be doable right now. Might be. If you get good Ryan Fitzpatrick showing up for those games against Cleveland and against Baltimore and even against Cincinnati, you know, you could win those games. So maybe they don't discount them just yet, but you're in a bye. Maybe you let Ryan, Ryan Mallett go because you know what you're getting out of Fitz. It's been the same thing that happened in Buffalo his entire career. You just go with that. Speaking of which, you come up number 18, the Cleveland Browns at 5-3. And, and this is what's funny about this year. We're at number, you know, number 20 was a team at 500. Number 18, you're above 500. Um, and a lot of people are probably trying to figure out why I don't have the Saints to slow. But we'll get to that in a minute. The Cleveland Browns, 5-3, and three, should be 6-2, and two, should have taken care of business against the Jaguars, should have taken care of a lot of business. I have it written down. Cardiac Browns, they are back. Every time they are good and relevant, they are the Cardiac Browns. I don't remember, you know, there has not been, since they came back, a Browns team that just dominated through for a bajillion yards. That doesn't happen with the Browns. If they win, they win ugly. Um... This team is definitely, it, you know, they're going to get Gordon back uh, just in time for the Bills game, I believe. 
Oh, no, Bill's game is later on down the road. Um, <coughs> Sorry. Eight games, so he's got an 11. Is it a 10 or 11 game? 9, 10, 11. So he's either back for Atlanta or Buffalo is when they get him back. Um, but you're going to get Gordon back. That's going to help out your offense. Brian Hoyer, whoever it may be. Um, you're going to... Um, I don't know. There's some options for him. There's, um, let me get Hail Mary and that, but yeah, so the Browns five and three, they, they should be in a pretty good position at Cincinnati home for Houston at Atlanta at Buffalo home for Indy home for Cincy at Carolina and then they finish off season at Baltimore. Realistically, they have a possibility, you know, they've only got, you know, five and three down the road. That's all they've got to do is five and three. And if they can do that, then they put themselves in pretty good position. I mean, you look at, at Cincinnati, that can go either way. Home for Houston, that could go either way. At Atlanta, should be a win, even though Atlanta plays better at home. At Buffalo, I'm sorry, Bills, but you you got to figure Cleveland should have a shot there. Um, home for Indy is probably a loss. Home for Cincy, that's probably your better chance at a win. At Carolina, could be a win. At Baltimore, eh. I mean, they've got a pretty tough schedule coming up. So I wouldn't say anything's a given. But... It's, I don't know. Cleveland, you, you got better chances right now than maybe you would have had ever in the last 10 years or so. You know, this is, I'm, I'm rooting for them because I just want to see Manziel stay off the field and stay off the field. I don't think they want to go to him. I think everyone else is the one talking about Manziel could come in. Um, but Hoyer, your stock is starting to get hurt right now. Uh, number 17, and this is actually going to be the last one on part one of the power rankings that I just realized is going to be, well, realized halfway through is going to be a two-parter. Number 17, I've got those four and four New Orleans first place Saints. Um, they are playing in the worst division in football, and I think that's going to help them immensely, not only because I think... 500 will win that division so they'd get a home game but i think just the level of competition not playing against anyone really good i think that is going to help them boost like bolster that record i don't think they're gonna get the two seed or the one seed but maybe that three you know as of right now number one seed is arizona number two is the lions and number three is philly so, your number one seed is a team with half its team on IR. Your number two seed is a Lions team that cannot get its offense going. And your number three seed is a team with Mark Sanchez at quarterback. I could see them eyeballing that number three seed realistically. And a lot of people think I'm crazy because I think they'll go 10 and 6. And some people think I'm nuts because they're sitting at 4 and 4 right now. They have a home, they have a th they have three straight home games, and they don't lose at home. They've played most of their games on the road so far. They're four and zero, or three and zero at home, so they still have five more home games. That's looking like nine wins right there already. Home for San Fran, home for Cincy, home for Baltimore. No reason they can't win all of those games. At Pittsburgh could be a loss. Home for Carolina should be a win. At Chicago, Chicago doesn't win on the road could be a win. Home for Atlanta could be a win. At Tampa Bay should be a win. Even if they blow one road game or one home game, that's 10 and 6. Really, the three stretch of the um, three straight games against the, uh, the AFC North, I could see them losing two of those. And other than that, waltzing through the rest of their schedule. And again, they have the advantage of having three, you know, two of those three games against the North that they have left at home. So, 
th- yeah, ten and six, even eleven and five is in play. And let's be hundred percent honest, twelve and four is in play because that's actually a pretty considering what a lot of the other teams have. That's a pretty easy schedule. Pittsburgh is all over the place. They're inconsistent. They've looked dominant the last two weeks, but three weeks ago they got blown out thirty-one to ten against the Browns. You know. San Francisco is wildly inconsistent, and they catch them before they get Alden Smith back. Cincinnati is not the same team that started off 3-0. The Ravens have had issues. Um, Carolinas look terrible. Chicago's look terrible. Atlanta and Tampa Bay are two of the worst teams in the league. Literally, they could win 10 straight games, and I would not be surprised. So there's a lot of reason to like the seeding aspect of where this New Orleans Saints team could end up. So... I don't necessarily feel confident that they will be in the Super Bowl like I originally picked them to be. But I really do think, not only have they already clinched their division, but I really think a number three seed is in the is could be in the making. And a number two seed, with their schedule, and with the teams that are in front of them, shouldn't be ruled out. I don't know. I wouldn't go so far as to say a number one seed. But you never know... Those teams in front of them, any of them could have their, you know, Arizona, if the wheels fall off, is anyone shocked? Philly, if the wheels fall off, is anyone shocked? Detroit, if the wheels fall off, is anyone shocked? Green Bay's already had the wheels fall off, and Dallas is in the middle of their wheels falling off. And the Seahawks haven't looked great. There is no reason to believe that the number one seed shouldn't be out of the question for New Orleans. And I know they haven't played well, but they've been in every game. You know, except for that Minnesota game... Or no, they won that Minnesota game. Never mind. So except for that Dallas game, um, 37-34 in overtime at Atlanta. 26-24 at Cleveland they lost. They win 20-9 against Minnesota. 38-17 at Dallas. There's your blowout. 37-31 in overtime against Tampa. Eh. 24-23 lost at Detroit. That could come into play for seeding. I didn't even think of that. Um... 44-23, annihilate Green Bay. 28-10, at Carolina, and they annihilate them. Um, You know, so they haven't... One blowout. One. One blowout loss. Close wins, too. But like I said, good teams win close games. So, they could get on a pretty good roll right here. But anyways, that will conclude part one of my mid-season power rankings... Needless to say, I didn't think it would take this long. And needless to say, there will not be a quarter ranking like I thought there would be. We are just going to do the midpoint. Um, maybe I'll do like a quick segment. We got a lot of buys coming up. So maybe at the three-quarter mark, maybe I'll just like run through the numbers real quick. Um, but this this is the last time I will be doing this this season. So anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, please hit that little like button. And also, please feel free to share it with your friends. We're actually... Um, I didn't realize this. I just looked at my subscriber number. It's actually coming up pretty well. I didn't realize that. Obviously, I'm not had a huge following, but we're up, I think, a good, what, 75% in the last couple of months. So please continue to share that. I see you guys doing it. I get the alerts, and I appreciate every single one of them. I appreciate every like. I appreciate it. Everything. Leave comments. Let me know what you think. Let me know what you want to argue with. Eric, I know you're listening. I know you're listening. Let me know what you hate about my Tampa Bay pick. Let me know everything I want to know. And maybe I'll get you on the podcast one of these days and you can just yell at me and berate me like the idiot that I probably am. Um, And you can accuse me of being a homer because as you realize we got through the top half and we have not talked about my Buffalo Bills. They're not that far behind. Don't you worry. So anyways, guys, thank you so much for watching and I will see you guys next time.